Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day you've made, and we rejoice in it. We continue, O oh Lord, our study of your promises, because we surely want to be able to stand on them. Today, O oh Lord, we look at calling and being chosen. Lord, anoint my heart and my tongue and my spirit and my mind and every part of me to declare this word this morning and anoint us to receive it all. May it be helpful to many, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would suppose that many of you know a good bit of my own personal story. Some of you might not. So for those of you who do, I ask for your patience in hearing it all again. And for those of you who don't, I pray that it's going to be helpful. Um, I was raised, born and raised in a Christian church. Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. That's where I was born. I was raised by parents who thought you were supposed to be in church every Sunday morning. Well, actually, every time the church with doors were open, that's where you were supposed to be there. You were supposed to be there. But from a very early age, well, actually, as far back as I can remember, which is a very long ways back. I never felt like I fit into my family. I never felt like I fit anywhere. And it was a hard way to live. And uh, it is was scary to think that I didn't belong anywhere. Now, it wasn't necessarily anything that my parents did or my family did, although I think maybe being raised with three brothers <laughs> might not have helped the situation. I was a little outnumbered. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, I, nobody did anything outwardly to me. It was all internal. It was all in my spirit. Even though I went to church every week, even though I heard the Word of God every week, I still had a sense I did not belong. There was a great deal of fear in my life. Uh, did I contemplate suicide? Absolutely, I did. Lots and lots of years of my life. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just a hard way to live. And... Uh, the reason why I bring this up is because as I think about this sermon series and standing on the promises of God and knowing that I came from a family that raised me in Christ Jesus, raised me to believe in Jesus Christ my Savior and Lord, I think about the millions of people, particularly today, particularly the millennials, who have no foundation at all. They are raised, they are being indoctrinated through our school system to think that they're nothing except some accident of nature and they evolve from some blob that just somehow accidentally became human being, but you know, there is no purpose in life. And so they have zero foundation, and so where is their hope? They have no place to put their hope other than themselves, but, well, that's not a very good place to go when you're told all the time that you really are nothing. I uh, saw a Twitter tweet, a tweet the other day that... Um, of course, I had to answer, because this person said, you live, you die, and then you rot. I'm like going, 
No, you don't. So if I could be in the church in my mother's womb for years and years and years and going through confirmation and Bible classes and all this sort of stuff, how is it I could be, I could have had such a, a horrible take on life? Well, the fact of the matter is, is the enemy is alive and well, and he's a liar. He's a liar. And I was able to share just a tiny, tiny bit of my story one time at a baccalaureate at um, the high school here in town. And I told him, I said, I felt like I never fit in. There was a horrible way to grow up. I was very sad all the time. My mother knew it. She could see it in my face. You look at a picture of me that Helen has seen, and I look really bad. You know, when the devil's got you, it's bad. I mean, there was no joy. And my mother didn't know what to do. You know, back then you didn't take people to counseling. Or it's like, and, you know, and really that wouldn't have helped, I don't think. The only one who could help was God. The Holy Spirit had to get to me. And, uh, and somehow, and it probably was the prayers of my mother and others who knew me very well, um, who the Holy Spirit who finally got a hold of me and through the word finally got through to me to let me know that even though I may not fit into this world, I fit into God's world. And that made all the difference in the world. I fit into his world. I fit into his plan. I fit into his purpose. Okay? That made all the difference in the world. When I told that story at um, the baccalaureate uh, ceremony, you know, when you're doing that in a group like that, you go, well, do I do it? Do I not do it? Or whatever. And, um, and so I did. And, and afterwards, a mother and her high school daughter came up to me and says, thank you so very much. That made the day. So apparently she was struggling too. A lot of people struggle. Even in the church. I mean, we spend a lot of time smiling at one another. But, but we struggle. We do. But then you come to a passage like Jeremiah 1. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Before I, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Those, you know, most of the first three lines of that passage belong to each and every one of us. The word of the Lord comes to us and says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I set you apart for my purposes. A couple of years ago, on the anniversary of my ordination, I, when I was still living at Banchetti, um, I you know, was talking to Betty, and uh, I said, well, today is the anniversary of my ordination. She goes, you know, all of a sudden she had this look on her face. I said, what? What did he tell you? I said, what's up? She said, well, God just told me he ordained you in the womb. You know, it wasn't that I was ordained by man. God ordained me in the womb. He ordained every single one of us for our purpose in life in the womb. He knew us by name before we were even a thought in our parents' minds. That makes all the difference in the world with how to live, how we're to live. This sermon series is about all uh, being able to stand on the promises of God and us learning those so that we can stand on them, but so that we can share with other people so that they can know the hope that is theirs too. Think about the millennials. Think about who ha the people who haven't been raised in the church to, to even know any of this word. Think about their hopelessness 
particularly if all they think is themselves they've got to stand on. And think about the fact that if we know these promises, we can look at them and say, yes, the world will tell you there is no God, but we're going to tell you there is a God. He loves you. He knows you by name. He knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He chose you to be exactly who you are. Of course, Jeremiah was ordained to be a prophet to the nations. That doesn't fit for us. We've all got our part, though, because we're part of the body of Jesus Christ. The body is not all a finger. The body is not all a toe or a nose. We've all got our part, and the body fits together. And these people got to know. The world is telling them that, nope, they're just a brick can be slotted in anywhere. It's Babel, you know. That's what the Shinar Directive is all about. How the world is, um, is brainwashing everybody to be just a brick. God made each and every one of us to be unique. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He knew our name before the foundation of the world. When you think about that, it's mind-blowing. And not only that, he has determined now that we'd be born now, that we would live now. He determined all of that. There are so many people who don't know that but need to know that. So the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you before you were born. I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. What's Jeremiah's response? Ah, Lord God, behold, I can't speak. I'm just a youth. Oh, my goodness, the the excuses we give God. I'm only a youth. My goodness gracious. You know, um, I was thinking about it. You know, God doesn't look at age like we do. You know, we tend to think that you're born, you know, you're born, you get to a certain age, then you can get out in the world and you can do your thing and you've got a career and so forth, and then you retire and then eventually you die. Samuel entered into the Lord's service at the age of three. Three. Moses entered into the Lord's service at the age of 80. You're like this next one. Noah entered into the Lord's service at the age of 500. You know, God doesn't discriminate with ages or people. He doesn't care what size or shape you are, if you're male or female. You know, he's called each and every one of us by name and he has chosen us to be his own. Now, the part that we have a problem with, or that we wrestle with, is, is finding out what our purpose is. Okay, if we're chosen, what are we chosen to do? Well, we're chosen to be his ambassadors in the world. And uh, we're, we're, so we ask the question, well, what does that mean? Well, the scriptures give us a good hint about that. But you know, I think when... I look at that, I'm like going, so does God have a grandiose plan for me? Or is it just a little bit? I think for the most part, we just have a little bitty plan to play. As long as we do our part, we're doing it. Okay? I was looking at Genesis. You know, Genesis chapter 5 and all those names. We don't know much about those people, those ten generations. I mean, we know that Adam was chosen by God to be the first man. Seth was his son, but we don't know much more about him. Enosh was his son. Canaan was his son. Mahalalel was his son. And Jared was his son. We don't know anything about those guys. Enoch, we know that he was the first one to walk with God. And then God took him. Methuselah, we don't know much more about him except that he was the oldest man that ever lived. 969 years. Lamech, we don't know much about him. And Noah, of course, we know a lot because he was commissioned by God to do the ark. We don't know much about these people, but if the only thing about these people was the fact that they bore 
the name that they had. The name that was part of the piece of the jigsaw puzzle of God saying, this is what my plan is going to entail. That's all that was needed. Because over those generations, God said, man is appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing comfort. You know, we don't know what our part is. But the vast majority of what we need to do is just put one foot in front of the other every single day and do what God calls us to do that day. You know, if it's talking to somebody at the grocery store or making a phone call or whatever, usually it's not big. But it might impact somebody's life forever. I think about the millennials, and I think about how they're being raised to be hopeless. And I pray, God, put people in their lives to let them know that you are real and that you love them and you care for them. Of course, part of our calling is, of course, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, as the church of Jesus Christ, we all have a general calling to follow the Great Commission, be obedient to it. Jesus said, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So we, we know that that's part of our commission. And you know that I've told you this many times. It's not about the pastor doing it, please. It's about everybody doing it. In the last couple of weeks, two weeks ago, I, I read a story about Sammy, the, the, most, the, the guy that lived in the Middle East, who his entire life is spent trying to get the message of Jesus Christ to Muslims. That's where his zeal is. Is Sammy a pastor? No. He's just a man who is on fire for Jesus Christ and so he lets people know about it. Is his life in danger? Absolutely. But he wants people to know. And then last week I, I read you that long section about Dimitri uh, Dudeman. Well, he wasn't a pastor either. He was a smuggler of Bibles. <laughs> but you know, the Lord used him mightily, not just to smuggle Bibles, but in the process of being obedient to the Lord, he ended up with a healing ministry. And so people he would pray for would get healed. He didn't go looking for that either. But both of these people, it was just simply in the process of their day-to-day -day living, the Lord calling them to do what they needed to be doing at that particular moment in time, and then following through on what the Lord was calling them to do, just by being faithful to their calling. Oh, how many people have said, God's given up on me? No, he has not given up on anybody. <laughs> Every single one of us have been gifted by God. We all have gifts, talents, and abilities to be used for the glory of God. Every single one of us. You know, we can't use the, the joke that says, no, one in line when that was happening that day. No. God didn't overlook any of us. We all have a gift and a calling. A couple of years ago, there was a bunch, there was a kind of a movement afoot trying to figure out, you know, what your gift and calling is. Unfortunately, you know how people get it. You know, once you find out what your gift and calling is, then you assume you can't do anything in any, any of the other areas. That's not true either. Don't we realize yet that God doesn't call the equipped; He equips the called. If He's calling you to, to a task, if He's calling us to a task, He's going to equip us for the task. We're all chosen, too. You know, when I hear the word chosen, I, I, I can't get away from it when we were little. Then I don't think they do this anymore because, you know, everybody gets a participation award. Um, anyway. But when I was little, you know, out on the recess, you know, you chose teams. And, you know, 
and you know you had captains of the team and they you know you'd line up and they would choose different people to be in the team well you know you always wanted to be cho chosen first but not everybody can be first and uh, but you certainly didn't want to be last <laughs> either we're chosen by God for Pete's sake the God of the entire universe has said yep that person is on my team you know and guess what? He doesn't bench us. And says, well, I chose you, but you're not going to play. <laughs> no! <laughs> we all get to play. But it's a very serious thing that we are called to do. It's very a very serious thing in what God is calling us to be in the world. Dare I say it again? We're in a war where there are casualties. And so we really do need to know who we are and whose we are. But we're chosen. We're chosen to be in this fight. What is it, what's interesting about this is that um, Peter, this is First Peter 2, talks about Jesus Christ and the fact that he was chosen to come and be the one the chief cornerstone, the elect, the precious one. But that we are being built upon him, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, and so forth. Um, but we're chosen. Why are we chosen? We're chosen to be a, a, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. His own special people, what are we supposed to do? That we may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What have I done this morning except give you my testimony of what he has done to call me out of darkness and into his light? I once was in deep darkness. But the Lord brought me into his light. Our story is unique to absolutely every single one of us. And it's a story that there are people who need to hear. Because some people look at people in the church and say, well, y'all are just too perfect. Excuse me? Huh. We have problems. We have issues. The difference between us and people who don't know Jesus Christ is we've got somebody to call upon and to fall upon and to lean upon and that's what we need to be sharing with other people. And so what does Peter say? We're called to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's our job. Now, it may not be the easiest thing in the world to share our story with other people. But... That's the story that's probably going to get a person's attention. What has God done for you, personally? Now, for a lot of people, they can say, well, before I was a Christian, this is the way I was, and God called me out of that. Well, I was always a Christian. I was born into the Christian church. I was baptized at the, at the age of one month. But that didn't mean I didn't have trouble. I'm sure you've got a few too, problems, issues that you had to overcome. It's those stories that help other people. Like I said, we have got a lot of people in our world right now who have been brainwashed by the establishment. And now they're being brainwashed by whole denominations of supposed Christian people. I would say not to that. To say that, you know, God is anything you want him to be. And you can do anything you want to do. And God just says, no. That's not true. So when we look at God's word and when we keep learning what these promises are, our, poor, our part is to learn them so that we can keep people putting people back and, and directing them toward the right way. Our story is important of what Jesus has done for us. It's just an amazing, amazing thing. 
Like I said, most of us are not going to be called to do anything major. You know, our name is not going to be written in the addendum to the Bible. But our names can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the best place to be. But we are called. We are chosen. And God has a whole bunch of other people that he is calling and that he is choosing to be his people. As times get harder and harder, we're, we're liable to meet some of those people who are going to need to know the hope that is in them and the hope that is there for them and the fact that they aren't just going to live, die, and rot. Our job is just to let them know. So we stand on that promise so that we can share the promise with others so that they can share the promise and stand on it and share it with other people. So I pray we will. Amen.